everyone. Uh, let me just start by uh, expressing gratitude to Viplov for letting me be here. And I'm really amazed and impressed by the, the sort of quality of the talk so far. It's, been, it's just been a really great and eye-opening uh, conference so far. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I've been doing uh, in Bangalore. I'll start out just with a brief background so you get a sense of where I'm coming from. I, I studied computer science at the University of Santa Cruz, uh, University of California in Santa Cruz in California. I grew up in Silicon Valley um, in Cupertino right next door to Apple and Intel and stuff. Uh, some of my friends from UCSC did the IUMA, the Internet Underground Music Archive, which was the first music startup. It was 1993, 94, and the mosaic had just come out and the internet just happened. I got my first job uh, in the original Java group at Sun Microsystems. Um, Java had just come out and was sort of this initial way of we were going to add um, interactivity to web pages and it was going to change the world and we were really the center of the universe for a while. Uh, Silicon Valley in the, the late 90s was really an amazing place in time. There was just uh, a huge amount of excitement. We could all sort of feel the internet changing the world and it was fun to be a part of it. Um, I did a startup, Kendara, um, got a bunch of people in, got funded, sold it a couple of years later to Excite at Home, and then moved to India, actually, in 2005. After selling Kendara, I had sort of this dream of doing an internet incubator. Basically, um, the, the internet's changing everything, and I kind of had this dream that there was just a lot of room to, to make lots of such companies. And in 2005, I sort of decided that, that India was actually the, the place that I wanted to try to do this, that the, I feel that the um, amount of sort of potential here is, is huge, the amount of, of things that need to get done is huge, and that this is really where it all comes together. I did a startup over here in 2006, and then also worked in um, running the iAccelerator, which was a, a tech incubator up at IIM Ahmedabad. Um, so I ran that program, or worked in the program in 2008 and 2009, which was sort of modeled after this uh, incubator that's very successful in the West called uh, the Y Combinator, which is all about sort of giving small amounts of money to young first-time entrepreneurs and helping them get established as um, as internet technology entrepreneurs. So I wanted to sort of give you this background because this is really where I'm coming at the education thing from. It's, it's coming from the perspective of trying to sort of come to India a little bit as an investor in trying to sort of get tech startups going. My experience in India has been that the in the, the tech sector, looking for high-end programmers, uh, a very experienced programmers are extremely rare and hard to find. There are a huge number of extremely eager and ambitious, not especially well-trained young people who desperately want to be in this industry. And so, so as you look at sort of like trying to sort of start companies in, and move forward, what everybody sort of comes to is that you, you really need to sort of, if you want to scale, if you really want to do things at any kind of level, that you really need to be able to take in young people and, and sort of help them develop the skills that they need to be effective um, as programmers, as, as developers for the web. The um, technology space is interesting from a couple of angles in that it's at least at the high end, it's very much a meritocracy. So um, people, uh, high-end companies very much are less interested in where you're coming from, what your degree is, and more interested in actually being able to see what you can do. It's also an area that um, lends itself to sort of automated testing in a way that um, few other areas do. Um, this is going to be a quick background, which. Um, we've already talked about, or several people have talked about, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more because I'm so excited about it. In the last year, uh, Coursera came out and it was sort of led by some professors from Stanford. I'm, I'm just gonna read their, their mission statement. Coursera is committed to making the best education in the world freely available to any person who seeks it. 
We envision people throughout the world in both developed and developing countries using our platform to get access to world-leading education that has so far been available to only a tiny few. We see them using this education to improve their lives, the lives of their families, and the communities they live in. Um, it's, it's a very ambitious, great um, mission statement. Um, I was actually part of the, or I took the artificial intelligence class that um, Stephen referred to early, earlier. There was also a, a machine learning class. Basically, Stanford has taken a significant part of their, their graduate computer science curriculum and made online courses out of, out of it, which you can take online alongside the, the students at, at Stanford. So Stanford is doing this on some scale. UC Berkeley is participating. Here there's a class by University of Michigan. Um, MIT is also, they, they started open courseware, their open courseware initiative maybe 10 years ago, but now they're doing this additional thing where they're actually launching these classes on top of the open courseware. Um, this is Udacity, uh, who we also mentioned earlier. Uh, we believe university level education can be both high quality and low cost. Using the economics of the internet, we've connected some of the greatest teachers to hundreds of thousands of students all over the world. Uh, I think it's Peter Thoring, or Sebastian Thorne was really the professor who ran this artificial intelligence class that sort of started this movement. That class had 160,000 people sign up for it. Um, there, of those 160,000 people, 23,000 people completed a significant portion of the class. Um, 300 people in the class got perfect scores. And none of those 300 people were at Stanford. So he, Sebastian Thurn, sort of came out of, came out of teaching this class. He been teaching artificial intelligence for, for several years, and he basically, after sort of going through this process, decided that there was no way for him of going back to teaching 30 students at a time. The, the, after you know, running a class and having 23,000 people get through it, have 300 people get a perfect score from around the world, he basically decided that the, that the traditional Stanford way of teaching was broken, and he left and started Uda City. So it, it just sort of gives you some sense of sort of like the, the excitement that these people are bringing to it. Um, so all of these things are, are pretty um, tech. One other place that I wanted to mention that I discovered is this University of the People, which is an initiative from the United Nations, which seems to be taking this concept but whereas Uda City, the Stanford classes, the MIT classes, the Berkeley classes are all giving you a certificate from the professor saying, you know, according to the professor, you get an A, B, C, or D, which puts you on at Stanford, but it's a certificate as opposed to a degree. What the University of People, the University of the People is doing is it's the world's first tuition-free online university dedicated to democratization of higher education, but they're actually um, granting degrees. So the entire, the entire curriculum is all these sort of online courses in the similar way, but they're all leading up to a bachelor's degree or a uh, master's degree, and that they're going through the accreditation process, I believe, in, in the United States. So, um, I'm sort of taking this as, as kind of my starting point. The, it's, it's, it's sort of amazing, like in, specifically in the field of, of computer programming and, and computer science, there's a huge amount of extremely high quality online materials. And th this is really how uh, people in the sort of software development profession learn. Like we, we, none of us really learned that much in school really. Like we all learned online and now the, the resources are, are just amazing. The, the question that I'm sort of um, grappling with now is, uh, so I, I, run, I run Jaga, which is this very large uh, 7,000 square foot space in Bangalore. It's sort of an art technology education uh, incubation space. And I'm trying to look at how, how can we support um, online learners? How do we, given a physical space, how do we make it more, 
more successful for, for people. Um, how do we help people be more successful in this process? What, what's the role of humans in, in this sort of world where all of this amazing content is available online? How do, how do people help? Um, is there a role for physical space? Or is it really something that you know, is now just people on laptops sitting by themselves? And, and possibly money, like. Um, and so some of the things that I've been starting to push on that I feel that humans um, can, can bring to this is this initial sort of step of um, providing sort of guidance or an advisory relationship. So basically, and we're starting to do this at Jaga, we're getting people to sort of apply and the idea is that once they come in that we have sort of an advisor kind of relationship where we, we kind of map out an academic plan with them where they, um, you know, we talk and figure out what their goals are and then we, we say, you know, here are a bunch of online courses, here are some projects, let's, uh, let's sort of approach it like this and trying to sort of take it from this sort of mass of, you know, anything is possible down to here are the things that we're supposed to do. Um, the other thing that we're doing is setting up sort of study groups, basically looking at how, you know, even if the classes are 100% online, that, you know, in our community in Bangalore, there are a whole bunch of people who are taking the artificial intelligence class, who are taking the database class. Can we get them together and, and create sort of a classroom-like environment where they're supporting each other? So that, um, so that they're, yeah, able to support each other. We're also lining up experts, basically looking in these, in these classes. Online, there's, there's really great support for people, but we're also able to sort of line up specific mentors who are able to answer questions. The other thing that we're pushing is we're, we're training, we're starting to train coaches who act as sort of personal, personal trainers, in a sense, for, peop for online learners. Um, the, the idea here is to sort of tease out from a, a traditional educator the, that part of their job which is, is kind of um, human encouragement, motivation, discipline. It's like, you know, are you doing your homework? Are you studying for the test? Like, are you, are you turning everything in on time? And th these things don't necessarily require sort of specific technical skills. And then there's the other part of it which is actual sort of like subject matter experts. So we're trying to separate that out and find mentors who can work a couple of hours a week, um, asynchronous primarily, maybe with some online office hours who can be mentors, but then training up locally these sort of coaches or personal trainers who can do the, the other part of it. The, and then we're also um, working on recognition, sort of in our physical space within the community, can we have an event or a party which really sort of recognizes the efforts of people um, who are going through and taking these classes and achieving stuff. So our goal is with the space is really to sort of try to create sort of a university environment without necessarily being able to afford hiring university professors. And so, you know, there's this, this sort of culture of, of learning, of intellectual thought, of sort of shared learning experience. And we're trying to sort of create that in our physical space uh, because that's something that we can do and um, that we also think is potentially scalable or rec replicable. The other thing that we're starting to explore is, is both getting employers to, to recognize it, and I'm pushing on that with this incubation thing that I'm doing, but we're also looking at sort of making sort of small student loans or scholarships to people who are pushing on online education. Um, just because my, my experience so far is that the, the people who are able to really dedicate themselves and go full time are able to put the time in and really sort of be successful in completing these classes, but the classes are hard and that if you're trying to do this in conjunction with doing another job, it's difficult. Um, yeah, I've talked about that. So this is, really, this is really sort of what the program that we're doing at Jaga is. It's like we, we try to put start and end dates to, um, to the, the university process. We get people to apply. We review them. We run them through this sort of advising thing. We give financial aid. We line up coaches, mentors, um, stuff like that.
Yeah, so that's really what I wanted to talk about, um, was, was just this effort that we're doing supporting people doing online education at Jaga. And uh, yeah, so I'm open to questions if anybody's interested. Uh, what kind of courses are we covering at jaga.in? So what we're doing is we're just going off of um, Uda City, Coursera, MIT, and University of the People. So I'm, I'm not trying to invent courses. I, I don't want to do that. They're, these groups are offering amazing top-rate computer science courses and some other stuff. So all we're doing is creating sort of a supportive environment on top of these top tier courses. So I can read them out. You know, it's like natural language programming, model thinking, software as a service, cryptography, design and analysis of algorithms. Um, so it's that's sort of where we're where we're at. We're we're trying to support the existing classes that are being taught by these institutions as opposed to us um, bringing in professors and trying to um, teach these subjects ourselves. Uh, what kind of, uh, sorry, uh, what kind of support you, are you giving to startup companies, uh, especially in technical, technically? Are you helping technically to uh, develop certain things? Yeah, so the, the startup support that we, we typically do is um, we give, bring them into a, a uh, sort of program where we're sort of following up with them. So we give a, typically a little bit of funding and then we work with them on refining the idea and then we follow up with them every, every week or so on, on just sort of seeing how they're pr progressing and sort of the same sort of coaching kind of um, mechanism. And then we make connections how we can make connections. Um, so my, my goal with the university stuff in some sense is to feed them into the, the incubator. Like I'm sort of doing the, the university stuff in some sense as, as sort of lead gen of, of potential entrepreneurs to go into the, the incubator part of my, my world. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you talked about uh, uh, you know, having coaches, mentors, subject matter experts, and uh, technical support and such things. But uh, how uh, cost effective is this and how Scalable is this model where you have so many people supporting the learner. Uh, so would it be possible to establish so many people around him? Yeah. So my feeling is that the the primary the primary person who's investing a lot of time is this coach, and I'm trying. We're going through the process of sort of hiring and training coaches, and my feeling is that they're actually because they don't need to know the specifics of you know game theory or natural language processing that those those people are actually relatively inexpensive. And so they can be fairly high touch, but they're, they're relatively cheap. The, the higher end people of the, the mentors, the subject matter experts, they're only really committing you know, one or two hours a week. And the assumption is that they have a full-time job. So, so I, our experience is that people are willing to sort of volunteer for either very little money or no money um, if their time is being utilized well. And so by having the coach, we, we help make sure that the time that students spend with the mentors is, um, is useful. So, so there, there is some cost, but the prim the most of the cost is going into these coaches, the, the sort of personal trainer people. Um, so because of that, I actually think the model should replicate well. Um, it's like I think that anywhere we can train these, these coaches, and then we can find the, the, the mentors online. Um, I'm still working out exactly what the costs are, but my feeling right now is that it's, it's manageable.